There are about uh, 750 species of butterflies in North America, north of Mexico, and um, in South Carolina, Georgia, probably about 125 to 150 species, and in Florida, it's probably about 250 to 300 species. So it's, when I was in graduate school at Clemson, taking wildlife biology courses, there was never any mention of insects as wildlife. Uh, fortunately, there's been a lot of evolution in the, in the topic of wildlife biology since then, so that at least in some states in the great United States, insects are now treated as wildlife. Unfortunately, South Carolina has not really evolved to that point yet. There's very little uh, recognition and management of, of insect populations, which is somewhat unfortunate because they are the base, one of the, the basic ingredients of the entire food chain and uh, ecosystem. So anyway, worldwide, there are about uh, between 10 and 20,000 species of butterflies, and you might ask, why is there such a great range there? Because the tropical regions of the world are most diverse in all types of wildlife and plants, and those are the regions that have been, regions that have been least studied by scientists. And in fact, there are probably many species that are disappearing from the face of the earth, earth before they're ever cataloged by science. Um, moths which are very closely related to butterflies. I'll talk a little bit about those, and we'll take questions later on, but there are probably 10 times as many species of moths, pretty much in just about any given region as there are butterflies. I'm gonna address primary butterflies in the coastal zone, which is uh, pretty much seaward US Highway 17, so the coastal counties. Um, and I'm gonna, there are many ways to attack this topic, but I'm going to do it sort of from a size perspective and kind of go up the, instead of doing phylogenetically, although that somewhat follows different orders, different families of butterflies generally are, have different size ranges. But our smallest butterflies are in a group called the gossamer wings, um, includes butterflies that are grouped and called blues or hair streaks, some of our really small butterflies. This is actually the smallest species of butterfly in eastern North America. There's a closely related species on the west coast. They feed on, as larvae on sarcoconia or um, glassworts, which is a plant that occurs in high marsh or salt flat type habitat. So these butterflies are seldom found more than a few yards away, away from these habitats. Um, a good generality is that small butterflies have very small home ranges. Large butterflies have much greater home ranges. In fact, many large butterflies are very nomadic as adults. They don't even have a real home range. They just kind of wander about, basically looking for a member of the opposite sex. Small butterflies, and this is controlled primarily by wind. Small butterflies are not strong enough to get up and fly around in, in strong winds. So they generally stay near the ground and near in a small home range as opposed to larger butterflies that are much more powerful flyers. Anyway, this little butterfly has a wing spread of only about a half inch, max. Um, butterflies and moths both undergo the miracle of metamorphosis, which is a changing of forms. There are four distinct forms. There's no beginning or end. It's a cycle, it's continuous, like a slinky, basically, with continuous spirals. Uh, egg, for a convenient start, larva, pupa, <coughs> and adult. In butterflies, the pupa is called a chrysalid or a chrysalis. In moths, the pupa is called a pupa. <laughs> no butterfly larvae form cocoons. You often see this in books, newspapers, and everything about butterflies coming out of cocoons. They don't come out of cocoons. They, come, they emerge from the pupae, again, which are called either a chrysalis or a chrysalid. Most species of moths, in fact, do not make cocoons. All, lar all caterpillars of butterflies and moths do produce silk, but most do not make a silken cocoon, and the cocoon is simply a house or a housing for the pupa. So once they emerge as an adult, they don't grow anymore. In fact, the adult butterflies typically live for only two to three weeks. Uh, and the caterpillar stage actually outlasts the adult stage. And typical, typically, the caterpillar stage, which is where all growth occurs, requires about three weeks to six weeks, even. And there's all kind of variations on that scheme because some species of butterflies in the Arctic tundra, for instance, it takes them three years to go through a whole larval stage because they get interrupted by, by freezing. 
and they actually freeze solid and then thaw and so forth. So. Uh, the hair streaks are so named because they have these little <coughs> hair-like devices coming off the hind wings. They actually function as false antennae. These are the true antennae, and you'll see they have uh, alternate bands of white and black. It's very much like the scheme in zebras, where you have black and white alternate banding that helps disrupt the pattern, I mean the uh, outline, so predators can't cue in on exactly what it is and where it is. And then to uh, draw the attention of predators, they have these bright orange spots, typically, or some bright colored spots where these little false antennae, when they're at rest or feeding in a flower, they'll actually move their hind wings back and forth enough to show off those false eye spots. Typically, if you find one of these little butterflies, well, not typically, but oftentimes, you find them with that portion of the wing removed, where some predator, like a glass lizard or a green anole lizard or a frog or a bird or whatever, grabbed them and tore the wing away. They don't regenerate the wing tissues, but it does allow them to escape at least once from a predator. It's called a gray hair streak, very common. It feeds on many different plants. In the pea family is a larva, uh, very widespread. This one's on white clover, pretty common weed in lawns. Another very common one, particularly right along the immediate coast, called a red banded hair streak. You'll notice something that's pretty consistent in butterflies is they are named for markings on the undersides of their wings. The reason is, is that we typically see butterflies when they're at rest, because when they're flying, their wings are moving so rapidly we can't see the markings and colors very well. So butterflies, unlike moths, butterflies typically rest with their wings held together up over their back. Moths typically at rest hold their wings out to the sides, sort of like a, a, in a roof-like fashion. So a lot of moths are named for the markings on the upper surface of the wings, because that's what we typically see. So anyway, you'll, you'll see that. So this one's called a red banded hair streak, with a red band or orange band. Actually, I would call it an orange banded hair streak, but I may see colors differently enough than whoever named it. Wings spread over about an inch. Another species called Edwards hair streak, uh, usually found in uh, kind of sandy uh, oak, shrub, turkey oak type woodlands. Nectarine on butterfly weed, which is a native member of the milkweed family. Wings spread over about an inch again. This is uh, one that's fairly common right along the immediate coast. The larvae feed on oak. Live oak is one of its primary larval hosts, called a white M hair streak. Uh, so named for this marking, which could easily have been called a white W hair streak. <laughs> It's got a wing spread of about an inch and a, inch and a half, and, it, and the picture doesn't do it justice, again, because we don't see the colors on the upper surface of the wings. But I have one in the collection box up here, you'll be able to see it's got brilliant metallic blue on the upper surface of the wings. Then there's a whole group of small butterflies that are actually intermediate in characters between butterflies and moths. They're included typically with the butterflies. They're, they're, not, they're, they're not true butterflies, and they're a little bit distant from the true butterflies, but they're active during the day, unlike moths. Their bodies are heavier, their wings are smaller in relation to their body, but they have very strong muscles, so they fly very rapidly, unlike most moths. But they also have some kind of fluffy scaling on their wings and bodies, like a lot of moths do. They're called the skippers because they fly by rapidly feeding their wings over six or eight strokes and then having a, a pause, so they kind of dart or skip through the air as they're flying, so that's how they get the name skippers. Most of them are not very colorful. This one is actually considered to be a rarity throughout its range in the southeast, and it's actually, I found it to be quite common on some of these marsh hammock islands or hummock islands because the larval host plant is fairly common around the fringes of hammock islands. Feeds on a plant in the pigweed family called um, Judah's bush. Then a horse's dusky wing, which is, is very common, it feeds again on its larvae on oak. And skippers are very avid flower visitors. So if you've had plants like lantana and other good nectar sources for butterflies, you'll have a lot of skipper butterflies coming. And unfortunately, they're, they're among the most problematic for identification for even people who have a great amount of experience, like myself, a lot of them can only be identified as species if you look at them under a microscope. So they're very difficult to identify between very similar species. 
This is just to give you a flavor of the diversity of, of, butter, of skipper butterflies. All of these occur in the coastal zone. I'll go ahead and point out now that another consistency in butterflies is colors betray the primary habitat type of butterflies. If they're mostly dark colored, particularly the bodies, that means they prefer shaded habitats. If they're mostly light colored, particularly the bodies, that means they prefer open habitats and it's all about solar radiation. If you're a dark colored butterfly and you spend a whole lot of time in the open, you go overheat. If you're light colored and you stay in the shade, you're not gonna have enough, not gonna have enough heat for your muscles to function, you won't be able to fly. So you can tell a lot about where the butterflies occur mostly by the color. All of these have wing spreads of about an inch, these skippers. Like I said, they all occur in the coastal zone. This one you find oftentimes on fringes of forested areas, particularly in the morning, fairly early in the day, before the sun gets up real bright and hot, they don't move back into the woods. And this one, as you might guess, is more of an open area butterfly. This is amongst the most common skippers here, as you might get from the name, salt marsh skipper, the larvae feed on spartina grass. So it's very common right around the edges of salt marsh. It nectars quite a bit on sea oxide, daisy, which you find in the salt shrub. This one is named not for markings, but because of its habit. When it's disturbed, it usually perches in a favorite spot. When it's disturbed, it whirls about, and then usually come back and land right where it was. <coughs> So that's how it got, got its name. And then this one looks very similar, called a fiery skipper. These are both very common feet on a number of grasses, even long grasses, like St. Augustine, uh, Bermuda, centipede. It's very common in open areas. So they're very abundant at flowers and gardens. All wing spreads again of about an inch. I have a couple of fairly large species of skippers. This one is actually one that is very common in South Florida, even down in the tropics. That's where the name Brazilian skipper comes from. Feeds on canna lily foliage, and only canna lily foliage. <clears throat> um, it doesn't roll the leaves, the larvae fold the leaves over from the bottom to the top. So if you find leaves that are folded over on the edges, you may have a Brazilian skipper caterpillar in it. It's one of these, uh, what are called immigrant butterflies, or transient butterflies, that like all insects, butterfly populations, those that have multiple generations in a growing season, the populations get larger and larger and larger. If you ever had to battle with things like um, cockroaches or house flies, things like that, you'll notice that generally in the late season they get more abundant. True with butterflies as well. So some of the southern butterflies basically run out of space or available larval host plants in like South Florida or South Georgia. And late in fall, or late summer and fall, we'll get some moving up the coast sort of striking out trying to find new habitat. And they probably had an advantage over geologic time to butterflies that don't do that. Because as climate changes or whatever, these butterflies will be able to colonize new areas. So this is one that we see mostly in the late summer and fall because it's a, basically a tropical insect. So it can't tolerate freezes. So even though our winters are pretty mild, if we get one night of a hard freeze, it can kill out this butterfly in this area and then they have to recolonize from southern populations the next year. Wings from about an inch and a half or so. This is a, this shows you, I had to actually break the silken strands to expose the caterpillar. And caterpillars have various defense mechanisms. Many of them fold leaves over and they stay in the folded leaves during the daytime and then they come at night when visual predators like birds and lizards and so forth can't find them. So it was very nervous, these caterpillars. And you see this one started folding the leaf back over with silk. Silk is naturally elastic, so it, it stretches back in when it's pulled out, so it pulls the leaf back over itself. Mm -hmm. Then to the left, far left and far right are the pupae, or chrysalids of the same insect. Then one of our very common large skipper butterflies is the silver spotted skipper, so named for this silverish white, silvery white spot. This one's larvae also folds a leaf over and has these uh, false eye spots on its head. If you can imagine if you're a green anole lizard and you look inside this rolled up leaf and you see the big orange eyes looking back at you, you may decide to go somewhere else to find a meal. So it's a good protective mechanism. Wings right up close to two inches. This is our, particularly right in the immediate coastal zone, probably the most abundant large skipper butterfly. And again, primarily in late summer and fall, called a long tail skipper. One of the more colorful skippers, wings spread again approaching two inches. Larvae feeds on various lagoons. 
including wisteria. Now we'll get away from the skipper butterflies. <coughs> this is a butterfly called a pearl crescent. It's very common in open, damp meadows. Reason being is the larvae feed only on plants in the aster family, and most of our native asters grow along the edges of wet wetlands. Very common in those type associations. Again, it stays fairly low to the ground. If you're going along a road sh shoulder, going through a swamp forest or something where there's open sunny areas, you'll oftentimes see this little butterfly. Not, not as common on Kiowa as is this one. This is a close cousin that feeds only on creeping fog fruit, also called turkey tangle fog fruit. It's a native wildflower that grows in secondary dune areas and it colonizes road shoulders on the barrier islands. Uh, actually, it's an excellent little ground cover. It's in the verbena family. Practically all the flowers in the verbena family are, are big drawing cards to butterflies and other insects like lantana. So it's an excellent plant to put in something like a rock garden, something like that, an open rock garden to attract butterflies and it blooms all summer. It attracts even larger butterflies like uh, Gulf fritillaries, monarch butterflies, the big the cloudless sulfurs and so forth. But this one, this butterfly is found in just about totally restricted to barrier islands. Occasionally you see them in where there's colonies of this plant growing off the barrier islands, but it's most common on barrier islands. In fact, I saw one Sunday afternoon at Sullivan's Island, which is very early. We've had some very early emerging butterflies because of the age of the warm weather. Wingspread of about an inch, and an inch or an inch and a half. Then uh, this is a very common butterfly of open country, uh, typical of agricultural lands when roads or even on paved roads. You'll see them flying on paved roads. The males will take out territories and perch on the ground. And many of them meet their demise because they perch in middle of highways. The larva is active during the daytime. You see these stiff spines all over it. Several purposes. One thing, it makes us think it can sting us. Same thing with a lot of other higher animals. Yeah, but some people would argue that humans aren't necessarily higher animals, but I'm not going to get that. Um, probably more importantly, they're stiff, so it makes them kind of difficult to get down. So birds and other things that eat caterpillars, a lot of times will stay away from these stiff, bristly spine caterpillars because they kind of tap to get down your throat. Most important function of those spines is that they fend off parasitic insects. Other than diseases like viruses and funguses, probably the biggest enemy of caterpillars is other insects, as parasites. There are a number of species of flies and wasps that only live as larvae in the tissues of living caterpillars. So it helps kind of keep those flies and wasps from landing on the back to inject the eggs. Buckeye butterflies about two inch, two inch, two inch or so wing spread. I should have pointed something else. Uh, this butterfly, this slide is photograph I took. It's very deceptive. It's on a chrysanthemum. If you want to plant for butterflies, don't waste your money on chrysanthemums because man has ruined chrysanthemums by genetically engineering them so that they look good to man. <laughs> chrysanthemums in the aster family. Well, asters once upon a time all had open centers and petals around the edges, actually two different types of flowers, and call composites, ray flowers and disc flowers. The disc flowers, it's open center, and oftentimes it's a different color, is where the nectar is. Well, we've genetically engineered chrysanthemums so they don't have disc flowers anymore, so obviously there's no nectar. I raised this in my house from a caterpillar, came home for lunch when they was flying around my glass, in my sliding glass window wanting to get out, and I let it out, and the first thing it saw was chrysanthemums, so it lit there long enough for me to take a photograph, but it came up dry in its probings. So hopefully it found a better source of food. But it gave me a good photo op. This is a close relative, another uh, tropical species found very abundant in the Everglades region of Florida called the white peacock. Another one, we get these immigrants or emigrants coming up along the coast, primarily in the late summer and fall, but can't tolerate even 32 degrees will kill it in any growth form. So it's more tropical, subtropical species. Similar size to the Buckeye butterfly. This is one of our very common cool season butterflies, again about the same size, two and a half inch or so wing spread, called the American Lady. It feeds as a larvae on rabbit tobacco. If any of you know of rabbit tobacco, uh, 
That's probably an indication that there aren't too many of you people really Southern country folk. Because <laughs> I'm a Southern country folk, and my dad and my granddad told my brothers and I about rabbit tobacco and how they experimented with rabbit tobacco. That's how it got its name, the rabbit tobacco, is because people made cigarettes from it and smoked it. So my brothers and I, of course, had to try it. So I know a lot about rabbit tobacco, enough to know that I didn't want to smoke it more than once. And I think maybe that's why I never smoked cigarettes. <laughs> But this is, a, this is typical of a butterfly chrysalid. See the silk? There's silk around it, but it doesn't form a dense housing like a cocoon. They use silk to pull plant parts and stuff around, and they generally mimic plant parts. The ones that hang down like a Christmas tree ornament in pendant fashion generally mimic a dead or dying plant part. When a plant part dies, what happens? Gravity takes over, and it hangs down perpendicularly to the ground, like a Christmas tree on it. So they'll have, they are sculptured, unlike moth pupae, since they're concealed either in the ground, or leaf litter, or in a cocoon, they don't need to have all these sculpturing or architecture to make them look like something else, because they're hidden. Butterfly pupae are in there wide open. They need to look like something else for protection. So they oftentimes have these little projections and so forth, so it looks like a partly eaten leaf that's in the process of dying. And the larva again, see the stiff spines? None of the butterfly larvae sting. Many look as if they can. If we do, however, have, oh, a dozen or so species of moth larvae that can sting. This is more of a northern counterpart to the American lady called the Painted Lady. It's a migrant. We see it mostly here in migration in the fall. At the same time, monarch butterflies are migrating through. Same size as the American Lady, called the Painted Lady. <clears throat> this one is called a question mark butterfly, and you might question why. Well, again, the underside. If you look at one up here in the box, in fact, I may have another slide. I don't know if I do or not. But up in the box, I have one mounted with the underside showing. It has a silver marking on the underside of the hindwing that looks exactly like the punctuation mark, the question mark. In fact, there's a close relative called the comma <laughs> that has the comma punctuation mark on the underside of this wing. But there again, you see the chrysalis to the left. Looks a lot like a rolled up, dying, dead leaf. And then the larva again. It has stiff spines, but it also stays on the underside of leaves during the daytime, and at night it'll come back up and start feeding on the edges of the leaves. Another one of our woodland butterflies. Again, you see these dark butterflies. They like woodlands. Uh, this one's called a morning cloak, and you see the larva. You would not touch it, I bet you, if you saw it. Higher animals, are, we are wired to know that red and orange are warning colors. You better want to be careful with reds and oranges. So that's accentuated with this deep, dark, black background. So most vertebrates will stay away from this thing because they think for sure it can sting, when in fact it can't. In fact, these butterflies feed in, uh, larvae feed in big groups to further display the fact that they're probably not good to nest with. One of our more beautiful butterflies, I think, is called a morning cloak. This time for the colors on the upper surface of the wings because whoever named it thought that the colors resemble those of a priest's vestment at a funeral service. Hence the name Morning Cloak. Wings spread over about three inches or better. Another one of our woodland butterflies, this one's called a Red Admiral for the Red Admiral stripe across its wing. Here. Larva feeds on plants in the nettle family, so up north and in the mountains of the southeast, they feed on stinging nettles. Here in the coastal zone, we don't have stinging nettles, fortunately, but we have what are called false nettles in the same group of plants, but they don't sting. They look like stinging nettles, but they don't sting. And that's what they feed on. It's a wetland plant. This butterfly is generally found in uh, wetland areas. Um, this displays the fact that, that in fact, some species of butterflies, we think of butterflies as being the most desirable of all insects. I think if I poll everybody in here, they pick their most favorite insects, they would say butterflies. I mean, they eat nectar, right? Kind of like a god or something. Well, actually, 
many butterflies eat things that we would think of as being pretty detestable. <laughs> In fact, the woodland butterflies, if you go for a walk, probably you can find some deep dark woods on Kiowa. They're becoming less common. You go for a walk in the deep dark woods, how many flowers do you see? Most flowering plants require sunlight. So butterflies that spend most of their time in deep dark, deep dark woods do not feed on nectar. They feed on other sources. Of, they do suck juices up through a, through a drinking straw, basically. It's coiled under their head, called a proboscis. But they feed on other liquid sources, such as dead animals. Snakes are a real big draw. They like snakes for some reason. Animal droppings. Fermenting fruits, which is what this red animal on the left lower is feeding on a decaying grape. Pears are a big draw. A lot of the decaying fruits. Um, and wounds in hardwood trees, when the sap oozes out and starts to ferment. A lot of these woodland butterflies are, are drawn to that. And honeydew, which is a secretion from plant lice type insects like aphids and scale insects. So, Red apple, the only flowers I, I've seen it on very few flowers. One is this plant called ground cell tree that blooms here in the fall. It's such a critical food source for, for migratory monarch butterflies. I've also seen it on lantana. And actually, I saw one on hen bit just this week for the first time ever on hen bit. But there's the chrysalid. It's adorned with some gold spots, which are pretty cool, but otherwise, it looks a lot like a dead leaf. Red spotted purple, again, I may be colorblind, but I would have named it an orange spotted blue green. <laughs> Maybe not as catchy as red spotted purple, what do y'all think? <laughs> this doesn't look purple to me and it doesn't look red, so. Billy, yes. where the butterfly is at the top? We can't identify it. Here? Right, where is it? Well, this is, this is the larva right here. Okay. Uh, it's got a disguise that many insects have, particularly caterpillars, it mimics bird droppings. The primary predator of insects during the daytime is birds. So what better to resemble than a bird dropping because birds don't eat droppings. <laughs> so it's mimicking a bird dropping, and in this, this is the pupa, it also mimics a bird dropping, and in this, this caterpillar is over here, is now suspended itself from a silken pad that's about to molt. Caterpillars molt five times in order to grow. The fifth time they molt is when they change from a caterpillar to a pupa. So most of them use specialized hooks and they sink them into a little silken pad that they put on a substrate, branch or whatever. And then against the force of gravity, they wiggle out of their last caterpillar skin and it comes off at the head, at the rear end, excuse me, it starts, they break out of the head first, it comes up and it falls off up here going against the force of gravity. So that's what that is. That's, the, that's this caterpillar that's turned upside down, and this is the adult. Another woodland butterfly, you can tell from the colors, doesn't go to many flowers, but it does go to lantana occasionally and to butterfly bush. But you see it on, this is one that I oftentimes see on animal excrement and dead animals and decaying fruits. When it's spread about three and a half inches or so, so it's a pretty good size of butterfly. Then there's a group of butterflies that are called satyrs. If any of you took Greek mythology, these little elfin woodland uh, elves were called satyrs. And these are small butterflies. They live in the woods as their colors betray. They're drab colored. They actually blend in with the forest floor. And they're pretty cool in that all species have these eye spots around the periphery of their wings to draw the attention of predators. They're not really fast flyers. They depend on stealth and camouflage for survival. And you often see them when the parts of their wing removed where birds or whatever have grabbed them. This one's got a wing spread of two and a half inches, so it's a pretty good size member of that group. Call it pearly eye because of the pearly eye spots around the edge of its wing. The larvae of that one feed on uh, giant cane, different uh, plants in the cane group. Then we have a very common one here that's very common in hardwood forests, even in maritime hardwood forests, called the Carolina satyr. Small, only about an inch, a little better wing spread. Very similar um, color scheme with a kind of drab, blends in very well with the leaf litter, and then the eye spots around the periphery of the wing. And it's feeding on a fermenting apple. So they feed a lot on the fruits, fermenting fruits, because again, there aren't any flowers in the woods. 
And this is one that's pretty common along the coast because the plant it feeds on is called sugarberry. A lot of people call it hackberry. It's a tree that's got the warty bark. It's uh, very common in soils that have a higher calcium level, like where the shell mounds and things. But there's four species of butterflies we have here that feed mostly on that plant. So it's an excellent plant to have around if you like butterflies. And also it's an excellent wildlife plant because it produces fruit that a lot of migratory birds use in the fall and winter. This one's called the American snout. So named because the mouth parts, non-functional mouth parts, called the labial palps, extend way out in front of its head, kind of like an elephant's trunk, <coughs> a snout. So it's called the American snout. It's got a wingspan of about an inch and a half or so. The upper surface of the wings have orange banding on them, so it's uh, very well camouflaged on the other side. This is the way it's posed generally when it's at rest. It'll sit on a branch and obviously looks a lot like a dead leaf. And then this one <coughs> is, see that caterpillar? Then it, it's pretty striking, isn't it? Very easy to see, right? In the animal world, if you can see something real, real well, it's probably something you don't want to eat. It's advertising that I'm not to be on the menu. If they can easily be seen, there's a reason for it. At least they want you to think there's a reason for it. So that's the zebra long wing larva. It feeds only on plants in the passion flower group, maypop. Again, I don't know how many of you are country folk from the south, but we used to make little men out of maypops and toothpicks. So. <laughs> Didn't have a whole lot to do back in those days. <laughs> Didn't have video games. Uh, anyway, this is this shows you that about a, about an hour before a butterfly emerges from the pupa, you can actually start seeing the colors of the wings show through that exoskeleton of the pupa. So you can actually see the pupa, and if you didn't know what kind of butterfly it was before, you, a lot of times you can make a pretty good guess because you can start seeing the colors of the wings. So anyway, this is the adult zebra long wing. Very, uh, very beautiful butterfly. Again, it's one that's most common in tropical areas. We get them almost every late summer and fall. We get them particularly along the Barrier Islands. And it comes to Lantana quite a bit as a nectar source. Wing spread of three inches, three and a half inches. But you'll see the very long spines on this one. It's easy to see, right? So wasps and flies that want to put a larva on, want to lay eggs on it, can see it very well. So it's got really long spines that help kind of fend those things away. But that the axiom, you are what you eat, is very true in the world of insects because these things feed on passion flower foliage. Passion flowers have chemicals in the leaves that hardly any other animal can metabolize. So they act as poisons, particularly to vertebrates. In fact, invertebrates, most invertebrates can eat them, like spiders and praying mantids and things like that. But vertebrates cannot eat them. They'll get sick, at least. So that's why it's so easy to see. Then the Gulf Fritillary, one of our more abundant butterflies, particularly in the coastal zone. Uh, many people mistake it for a monarch. Actually not marked all that similarly to a monarch. Much brighter orange, less black, smaller butterfly, more rapid wing beat. Uh, also very common here from June to frost. Monarch butterflies very uncommon here except from September through November. <clears throat> Although there's some monarchs here now. Wing spread of about two and a half, about well, probably about three inches. Uh, again, the larva feeds on passion flowers, so it's bright orange. It's advertising that I'm not to be eaten. And this is the male, and that's the female. So they're slightly sexually dimorphic. The males are a little bit more bright in color than the females. In fact, that's a trend that's exhibited throughout the animal kingdom, except in humans. <laughs> always look around and make sure there's more women than men. <laughs> but I'll go on record as saying women are much more attractive than our men. <laughs> but in the animal, most of the animal world, it's actually the guys that are, that are more attractive. They're advertising themselves. This one's called a variegated fritillary. Again, the larva feeds on passion flowers, so it's bright orange. Nothing on it, or at least vertebrates. And the adult, again, is orange. Again, it's got those same chemicals assimilated in its body as an adult. You'll notice when butterflies are at flowers, gulf fritillaries often are just like that, basking in all their glory, no, no big hurry to go anywhere. 
But if it's a cloud of sulfur or some other edible butterfly, they're very nervous. They're darting around from flower to flower. They don't stay put very long. But this one somehow has a sense that it's protected, so it just kind of sits there and bask in the sun and slowly eats. <clears throat> this is the viceroy butterfly that I'm sure many of you learned about as a classic example of mimicry with the monarch butterfly. Uh, <clears throat> theory being that monarch butterflies, monarch butterflies do feed on milkweed as larvae and they have chemicals in them that are heart toxins. The theory was that viceroy butterflies evolved to mimic monarchs. That's partially true, but there have actually been studies shown that in certain parts of the country, viceroys actually have, are more toxic than our monarchs depending on what the larvae are feeding on. But there, I know there's truth to that mimicry uh, plan because in South Florida, there's another species, I'll show you here in a minute, that, that the viceroys mimic other than the monarch. So in South Florida, the viceroys don't look like monarchs. They look like a queen butterfly. Anyway, this one, uh, this one is feeding on honeydew. The honeydew, honeydew from aphids, again, a byproduct of feeding of aphids. The honeydew was obviously fermented because the butterfly was drunk. They're usually very shy butterflies, and I actually could get this one to open its wings so I could photograph it, I'd have to touch it. And it'd slowly open its wings, and I could take a picture, and then it'd fold them back. I'd touch it and open its wings. And then this one is on uh, fermenting grapes. It's around wetlands, typically, because the laurel hose plants are wetland plants. Willow and um, cottonwood are the laurel hose for the red-spotted purple, and those are, I mean, for the Viceroy butterfly, those are wetland plants. This is the monarch, that again is the mimicry pattern for most viceroys. The larva feed on milkweeds, then the pupa also has those toxins, so it can have these nice adornments of gold and stuff, because if anything eats it, it'll make them sick, unless again it's an invertebrate. I've seen praying mantids just gorging themselves on monarchs at monarchs roost communally which I'll show you in another slide or two here later in. Praying mantids in the fall will just eat them like they're the all-you-can-eat buffet. <laughs> but this, this monarch, I took this photograph on James Island, this butterfly could have originated in southern Canada or New England, taken in October. So it already could have easily migrated four or 500 miles to get to, to James Island. This is a non-migratory counterpart of the monarch. It's very common in South Florida. And in South Florida, the viceroy butterflies look very much like this. They're cinnamon brown, brown colored instead of bright orange like a monarch. Called the queen. We get those here, particularly in the late summer and fall, as an immigrant again coming up the coast. In fact, because of global warming, climate change, the cause of which is obviously up to, this, to uh, dispute, that butterfly has now become a resident here. They, uh, they're able to tolerate the winter probably in the pupil stage, because I see them now in the fairly early, like in late May. So it's too early for them to have migrated up from South Florida. Wings spread up about four inches or so. The larva feeds primarily on a plant that grows right along the um, transition zone from salt marsh to upland, called swallowwort. It's in the milkweed family. Then we have a group of butterflies called the sulfurs. So named because most of the butterflies have yellow pigments, like the element sulfur. This one is uh, probably our most frequently seen butterfly, the cloudless sulfur, so-called because it's active mostly on bright sunny cloudless days. This one's also very common, and actually this is one you start seeing very early in the, in the spring. I've seen a number of those in the last several weeks. Sleepy orange butterfly, a little bit more of a highway department orange color. Exact same color as the center lines on the highway and on the highway department trucks on the upper surface of the wings. You'll see them up here in the collection box. This one is more of a summer butterfly, one of our smaller sulfur butterflies, wings spread only about an inch. Flies low to the ground, very common on the barrier islands and open sandy type areas. Feeding on Florida Pushley is named that little wildflower, very good nectar source. Cloud of sulfur again shows you something else. They are the poorest barometer to judge the value of a flower as a nectar source for butterflies. They'll go to anything. So this is called Turk's cap or sleepy hibiscus. Terrible nectar source for butterflies. Good for hummingbirds. But cloud of sulfur is a go-to it. Most butterflies see mostly in the ultraviolet range of the spectrum. 
So red or infrared is farthest removed from ultraviolet. So most of them don't see reds very well at all. So they don't go to red flowers. And in fact, there's a trend that most red flowers are long and deep throated. Hummingbirds see red very well. So a lot of times hummingbirds pollinate red flowers. Bees and butterflies and other things uh, pollinate other colored flowers, but you gotta be careful because they see colors we don't see. And oftentimes there's ultraviolet colors on red flowers. But anyway, cloud of sulfur is going to just about anything. If you play golf and you use a yellow or orange golf ball, you'll see cloud of sulfur coming out and inspecting your golf balls all the time. <laughs> this one is probably amongst the rarest butterflies in South Carolina. There are two subspecies. One, they're isolated, used to be isolated. Um, back 150, 200 years ago, they were isolated by the expanse of woodland habitat inland of the Barrier Islands. Now most of that's been felled for human development. But the Barrier Islands contain a, a unique genotype of this little butterfly called a falcate orange tip. Gorgeous little butterfly. It comes out one of the earliest butterflies of the spring. It feeds on a wildflower that's called a spring ephemeral. Ephemeral means short-lived. There's a little wildflower in the mustard family that comes up about now. And as soon as the temperature gets over about 80, 85, it dies. So this little butterfly has one adult brood per year in the early spring. And it's almost been extirpated because of human development along the coastal part of the southeast. It only occurs in the southeast. Um, I did a survey of Morris Island several years ago for uh, this purchase that still uh, hasn't taken place yet. And actually found a population of these on Morris Island, which is pretty uh, significant. Hopefully it still occurs on Kiowa, but I don't know, I haven't been out here a whole lot in the spring to look for it. It may not, because well-groomed open areas don't support the larval host plant. The last two slides are on the swallowtail butterflies, which are their favorites for the most people because they're big, often kind of gaudy colored. This one is, actually is one of my favorites, called a zebra swallowtail. Probably my favorite because it's not common. The reason it's not common is because the larvae feed only on pawpaw, which is a shrub. It's generally associated with bluffs along river flood plains. So if you go down to Savannah River in Jasper County or Hampton County, they're all over the place in season. Or if you go up the Great PD River, even all the way down into Georgetown, you'll see them. But right in Charleston County, particularly southern and central Charleston County, it's non-existent pretty much. Long Santee River occurs, so it's mainly associated with river bluffs. Black swallowtail, practically everybody has an opportunity to see that because if you plant an herb garden and you have parsley or fennel or dill, you'll get what a lot of people call parsley worms, which look like that. They're actually the larvae or caterpillars of the eastern black swallowtail. Very pretty butterfly. You see that the swallowtail butterflies, the pupae, the larvae actually put a silken sling around the middle to hold them at an angle to a stem. Well, what's an angle to a stem? Living leaves. So they're green, but they also can come in brown, so they mimic a broken branch. <coughs> Wings grab about four inches, three and a half more inches. Spice bush swallowtail feeds mostly on sassafras as a larva. Again, same thing, the silken sling that holds it at an angle to the branch, to the limb. That's the larva, it lives inside a folded leaf, and again, it's got a big false eye spot. Male, male's here, and that's the female, a little bit darker. Most of the female swallowtail butterflies actually mimic another one of the swallowtail butterflies called a pipe vine swallowtail. It's most common up in the mountains because it feeds on pipe vine plants that have toxins in them. So they benefit by looking like the pipe vine swallowtail. But the males don't undergo that disguise, which again shows you, at least for the women in here, that females are much more valuable than our males. <laughs> Throw out these lines and it's never done any good. <laughs> <clears throat> this, at least probably up until this time in history, 
because we are history, at least a second beyond when I get it out of my mouth, was, and I'm going to say was because probably by the end of the day it would be less common than it was before, uh, it used to be the most abundant swallowtail in the southeast along the coastal zone. Problem being that its larval host plant is red bay. Problem being that there's an invasive insect introduced into the port of Savannah that carries a disease that's killing off all the red bay. So the future of this butterfly is at risk. Very large wing spread up though, approaching six inches. That's the larva on red bay. It again lives in a folded leaf during the day and you see the big false eye spots. So if something looks in, they see this big bulbous head with it's about as big as my little finger, the caterpillar does. So you look in and see those big eye spots, you kind of might want to go look somewhere else for a meal. This is the state butterfly of South Carolina, boring. The <laughs> reason being it occurs over the whole eastern part of the country, from the Rocky Mountains to the coast, and from Mexican border all the way to Canada. They could have picked something much better, but the Garden Club of South Carolina selected this as their state butterfly. They consulted me, but it was after the fact. <laughs> and I told them just that. <laughs> no. Uh, the female, remember I told you that there's this one that they mimic, the females mimic? Well, that butterfly, I can tell you, the, very, the pipe vine swallows. I don't have a photograph of one, but I got one in the collection. It's most common in the mountains, very uncommon in the coastal zone, although it does occur here. So interestingly, the females don't benefit a whole lot in this part of the state from looking like a pipe vine swallowtail. So in the coastal part of the state, most of the females look like this. They light color with bluish on the hind wings. The males are richer golden yellow. But if you get up in the mountains, practically all of the female tiger swallowtails are black with this blue. And you can still see, they're not dark, dark blacks. So you can still see this banding on their wings. I have one in a collection box of it so you can see it. One of the dark, called dark form female tiger swallowtail. So up there they benefit from looking like this pipe vine swallowtail, but down here they don't. So it's all a process of survival of the fittest, basically. It's genetically controlled, so most of them, that they don't benefit from looking that way down here, so they get eaten at the same rate as the yellow ones. So there's no benefit, but up in the mountains all the yellow ones get eaten. So obviously the genes that remain are from dark ones. And it looks, uh, this chrysalid again looks a lot like a, a dead, broken branch. This is our largest butterfly, appropriately named giant swallowtail. The larvae feed on plants in the citrus family. So if you have ornamental citrus trees like uh, Myers lemons or trifoliate orange or whatever, you'll probably get the larvae. And in fact, in Florida, where they have a big citrus industry, they actually call this caterpillar. We call the caterpillar the orange dog because it feeds on orange trees and because they think the head looks like the head of a bulldog. And as you know, most farmers can't stand anything that blemishes a single leaf. So they think it's a pest, even though it probably doesn't do any real damage to the plants. Uh, butterfly larvae generally occur in a single individual spread around. The adults don't lay all the eggs in one spot, so they usually don't do a whole lot of damage. Anyway, here along the, the southeast coast, the native larval host is Hercules Club, or toothache tree, which is a common small tree in the secondary dune type areas with thorns all over it. It's called toothache tree because the Native Americans used to chew it, the bark, to anesthetize their gums when they had a toothache. Again, being a little bit adventurous, I had to try it. <laughs> I don't recommend it. I'd go to my dentist even though I don't like going to the dentist. Uh, it did anesthetize my gums, but I'm not sure if it actually did the job or whether it just tasted so awful that I didn't care about what my gums felt <laughs> like because it was horrid. So I suspect that even though this, in, this caterpillar looks like a bird dropping, it probably also would not be very good, to, very tasteful. It probably would taste like what it eats. I haven't gotten bold enough to try that yet, but maybe <laughs> one day. Wing spread of six inches or so, so it's gorgeous butterfly that you hardly ever see it away from the, within a five mile area of the ocean. Further inland than that, it's very, very rare. Now I got a few slides on monarch migration. I participated in a, in a tagging study run out of the University of Kansas. 
Um, so I tag monarchs in the fall with school groups quite often. I've tagged some out here with some of the lake staff, lake management staff. Um, the major migration corridors, there two there's two populations of monarchs. One's west of the Rockies, one's east of the Rockies. The, major, the ones west of the Rockies mostly winter in Southern California. The ones east of the Rockies mostly winter in Central Mexico, about 100 miles due west of Mexico City. Millions, tens of millions, up to 100 million individual butterflies in those big, in, this, in Mexico, in those mountainous colonies. Um, the major migration corridor for the eastern population of monarchs that are going to Mexico is down to central New U.S., the Midwest, Kansas, down through Oklahoma and Texas. However, we have a pretty good migration right along the east coast, and it's generally between the, then that migration is also split to some extent in that they move right along the edge of the Appalachian Mountains, right along the eastern slope of the Appalachians, and right along the coast. And that's the same place that the birds of prey migrate, and for the same reasons. You got the biggest changes in temperature over a short distance at interfaces of land and water and changes in elevation, so you get updrafts. So they can fly more effectively and efficiently. So that's why you have daytime migrations of both monarch butterflies and birds of prey in those two corridors. So we have a huge migration on the East Coast, nothing like what goes through the midsection of the country. Um, they've got the, mid the University of Kansas has been tagging monarchs since the early 1990s, had people, volunteers like myself, all over the state of country doing it. And actually, there were, there were studies done even back in the late 70s on migration of monarchs. That's how they identify those colonies in Mexico. They know now that practically all of the monarchs that go through the middle part of the country go to Mexico. However, we still don't know what happens to the ones that come down the East Coast. So I'll get into that a little bit more here with a couple more slides. A little bit about monarch metamorphosis. Again, the caterpillar suspends itself. They oftentimes get in what's called a J form as they're about to transition to the pupa. That's the pupa. Again, I tell you, about an hour before it emerges, you can see the colors. Then as it comes out, it looks all deformed. The wings are crumpled and looks like it's never going to be a beautiful fly, uh, insect that can fly. Within about an hour, the wings are totally extended. They pump body fluids out through a network of veins. Basically, it performs just like um, hydraulic fluid. And it unfolds the wings and extends them. And then when they finish doing the job, they withdraw those fluids back into their body. The, the veins seal off at the body. And before they take their first flight, or as they're taking their first flight, they eject all that excess body fluid because they don't need excess weight. So it's actually a last ditch defense mechanism. If something bothers them when they're in the process of just getting ready to fly, they'll actually squirt that nasty fermented concoction of body juices out of their abdomen. This is the migration this past fall to show you the timing as they progress from southern Canada and northern, the northern tier of the United States. This is the eastern population again. It shows you how most of them go down through here and into that's the, the overwintering colonies in central Mexico. So that we don't know what happens to the ones that make it down this far south. We don't really know where their destination is. It's been thought, it's, some people think there's evidence that indicates quite a few of them end up in Cuba. The problem is we don't have very good relations with Cuba. <laughs> so there's not a lot of research going on in Cuba. And I am the southernmost participant in that tagging study, I'm pretty sure. Um, this is another uh, indication of it. This shows you some of the summaries of my tagging. I've been tagging for 11 years, actually 2007, maybe the 12th year, I think. Um, about 11,000 monarchs, actually this 2007, 2008 was actually tagged a monarch today. I was leaving Fort Johnson and I saw a monarch on warm days in the winter. I was about to tell you, some of them winter here. And if you don't have a real hard freeze, like lower 20s, for a couple of nights, they can survive. So we do have monarchs that winter along the southeast coast. The weather conditions or atmospheric conditions in those mountains of central Mexico are very similar to what ours are here in winter. Very humid. We're humid here. It's warm all around, right? The barrier islands, small coastal islands. 
Mean nighttime temperature generally right around 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Mean daytime temperature usually around 55 or 60. So that's just what they have in Mexico. So unless we have a hard freeze, we have a good number of monarchs survive here in the wintertime. But there's still many, many questions about the East Coast population. There's probably collectively, if I went out on an extremely small branch, there are probably less than a million monarchs trying to overwinter in South Carolina. And that's not based on a whole lot other than conjecture. So there's up to 100 million in Mexico. But should something catastrophic happen there? It would be obviously in the best interest of the survival, long term survival of monarch butterflies if all their eggs aren't in that basket. So maybe at some point in the future, these small numbers that are winter along the southeast coast may be the, the, what causes the survival of the species. Anyway, that shows you some. I've, I've tagged, uh, like I said, uh, close to 11,000 monarchs, mostly at Folly Beach, and I've had three return from Mexico. Well, the rule of thumb, according to the University of Kansas, is for every 100 monarchs that are tagged in the central U.S., they recover one in Mexico. So obviously that's a much smaller percentage for the ones that come this far south along the East Coast. So again, that's a good indication that most of them don't go to Mexico. Anyway, I'm not going to read all that to you, but um, I've tagged, since we've had some unseasonably mild weather, and some of it's coincided with weekends, so I haven't been working. I've been able to get out, and actually I kept some out at work out at Fort Johnson because we don't maintain that place as well as you guys do here, so we got some weeds in the lawn like dandelion and stuff. So I tag monarchs occasionally throughout the winter there on one sleep and secretly mild days because it's right on the edge of Charleston Harbor, so it gets those same benefits of the moderating effect of the water. And then Saturday, when it was 75 degrees, I went to Patriots Point, and I saw 18 monarchs, 10 of which I tagged. I caught 11, actually had been the previous Monday, I'd given a talk up at Seaweed Visitor Center, and when I came back, I stopped by there, and I tagged one monarch, and believe it or not, I caught that monarch back <laughs> last Saturday when I was there. It was one of the 11 I caught, the butterfly net, but I saw 18, so that's a pretty good number of monarchs in that small area during the winter. Anyway, spring, these butterflies that, that moved through the fall, here in the fall, could have, um, become adult butterflies in August or even July. So by the time they get to South Carolina, our peak of the monarch migration usually here is about the middle of October. So they're a couple of months old already. By the time they make it to Mexico, if they go to Mexico, it's mid-November. And then they live throughout the winter, mostly being fairly dormant, but on warmer days, just like we've had here the last several weeks, they'll go out trying to find water, possibly nectar. And then at night, they get back in groups and, and uh, roost. So they've undergone all kind of rain events and wind and other kind of bad weather and they're very fragile. If you ever remove the scales from insects from butterflies' wings, you can blow on them hard enough to rip their wings. So every time they go to a flower, for instance, they make an encounter with the petals of the flowers and leaves with their wings. So that's why they're not designed to live very long. So it's fun. And the other thing is butterflies typically do not lay down fat, unlike me. <laughs> so they don't typically are not designed to live very long, but migratory monarchs, two things happen to those migratory monarchs. When daylight starts to shorten in August, a gene that's been laid dormant clicks on. It gives them the desire and ability to migrate. It also gives them the ability to change sugars into fats. So they lay, they lay down fat reserves that they draw from during that winter period of dormancy. So very phenomenal. The other quite phenomenal thing is they, fight, they migrate as far as 3,000 miles, but they are at least three, usually four to five generations removed from the last ones that did that. None of the monarchs that go to Mexico this fall have ever been there before, yet they go back to the same exact sites year after year after year. Um, people all the time ask me the difference in butterflies and moths. If you examine them, you can see some of the differences. Butterflies are daytime active, diurnal, moths are nocturnal, except there are exceptions to every rule, particularly with the moths. There's some species of moths that only fly during the day. Most of them that fly during the day mimic bees and wasps. Um, 
Butterflies typically, like I said, hold their wings up over their back when they're at rest. Maws out to the side. The scales on butterflies' wings are very tightly oppressed. They don't have a high profile. They're not feathery. Maul scales are often feathery. And that's because butterflies fly during the day. Their survival depends on speed. But if we could hear ultrasonic in the ultrasonic range, I know that their wings make noise. So if they fly at night, bats and birds and owls would probably catch them all. Whereas moths don't fly fast. They have fluffy scales so that it muffles the noise they make when they fly. So they're protected from nocturnal predators. Um, the antennae, again, since moths are not visual, many of them have very, um, very poor eyesight. Butterflies have incredibly good eyesight. They have compound eyes like a fly or whatever. You know, you can't sneak up on them very well. And I'll tell you from vast experience, monarch butterflies are much smarter than the average human in the year 2008. <laughs> <laughs> They're incredibly wary and difficult to get up on. But moths don't see hardly at all, but they have incredibly good olfactory senses. And their antennae, because of that, are usually shaped differently than those of butterflies. Butterflies have fairly simple antennae, usually kind of thread-shaped with a distinct knob on the end. Moths have different kinds of antennae, but the ones that have the poorest eyesight, to have basically no eyesight, have feathery antennae, and that's to increase the surface area so they can pick up chemical signals, pheromones. Many moths can detect a member of the opposite sex from miles away. got to be concerned about here is something that deer don't like. Right. <laughs> they eat Latin deer, don't eat Latin time much, do they? No. Uh, anything in the verbena family, like I said, is, is typically a good butterfly nectar source. And if you've got an open garden site, like I said, that little native plant, the fog fruit, is, is just an excellent butterfly nectar source. It blooms all summer like Latin town. That's the other thing about verbenas. Most of the verbenas bloom over a long period. There are many other good nectar sources, but most of them don't bloom for very long. Um, butterfly bush is good. The problem with butterfly bush is it doesn't like nematodes. And we have lots of nem nematodes, little parasitic worms that live in the ground that attack the root systems of plants and other things. But there are nematodes, that, soil nematodes that attack the roots of plants. And there are a lot of nematodes in the soil here unless you have um, a higher pH. So the best place to plant butterfly bush is on southern exposure near your foundation because you have um, leachates coming from your mortar that increase the pH. So it's, it keeps the nematodes out. So if you plant up near your foundation, you'll have a much better success than you would if you plant somewhere else. Uh, I mean, and there's lots of annuals that are good for zinnias. If you get old-fashioned zinnias, again, the key to any of the plants in the aster family is you need to make sure they have open centers, because that's where the nectar is. Um, but I, I would be pretty simple. With, I mean, I, I'm not simple at my house. I try stuff all the time, because I experiment with different plants. There's lots of different plants coming Black-eyed Susan? Black-eyed Susan are not great, but they would work. Um, cone flowers, pretty good. But the, I mean, the best are, are verbenas are still the best, and butterfly bush if you can get it to perform. But you can plant marigolds, zinnias, um, perennial verbenas. The annual verbenas are not nearly as good as the perennial verbenas. Probably because they're all genetic mutants that man has selected. So they probably don't have, don't produce a lot of nectar. If you were allowed to choose the state butterfly, what would you choose? <laughs> I would have probably chosen something like a great purple hair streak that I don't have a picture of, but I got one up here because it's a southeastern butterfly. The larvae feeds on mistletoe. That's pretty cool. Because mistletoe's, you know, highly toxic. Unless you're a bird, you eat the fruit. A lot of birds eat the fruit. But that's the only thing the larva feeds on is mistletoe. So it's a southern, it's a southeastern butterfly, and it's beautiful. Much more beautiful than a tiger swallowtail. A lot of them eat tiger swallowtails are fruit. So I would have chosen something like that instead of something that's quite so obvious. Because you have to really go out and look to find great purple hair streaks. If you know where to look, you can find them. And they're, like I said, they're beautiful. The problem is you can't see the colors on them unless they're 
collected or dead or in a field guide. <laughs> a lot of people, uh, again, are into non-consumptive wildlife nowadays. And I've had people that have gotten upset with me because I told them these were real butterflies and that I killed them. Um, and indeed, collecting is not necessarily a good thing, depending on the reason for which one collects. There are some people that collect, and they want everything that's the rarest because it has more value to them because it's become more unique when it gets incredibly rare. Those type of people are very bad for wildlife, including insects. People that collect in a more of a scientific way or an educational way and would not go out of the way to collect the rarest species, the last one of them, I have no doubt there are people that collect butterflies that would go to South Florida right now and try to catch the last Shouse's swallowtail if they could find it. Those type of people obviously are not the kind of people you want to have collecting. But if it, this, my collection is a scientific collection, I don't catch everything from one spot. And in fact, if it's a healthy butterfly population, it's like all species of wildlife, I would have to kill myself to try to eradicate that population. Kind of like white-tailed deer. I mean, you know how much effort goes into shooting white-tailed deer by hunters and look what's happening. Um, and the same thing with insects. We've been fighting insects. You know, cockroaches, fire ants, house flies, whatever, and fleas. I mean, you can't, you can't get rid of them. But if you destroy their habitat, then they're gone. And the insects that are on the threatened and endangered species list in more progressive parts of the country, we don't have any of those in South Carolina, are all have gotten to that condition because of habitat loss. And coincidentally, I'm sure it's coincidentally, most of those are in places where there's extremely high human population, <laughs> like South Florida and California. So collecting for the right, correct purposes is actually a beneficial thing because if you examine these specimens up here, each one has two labels on it. One is a locality label. Says exactly where it was within a tenth of a mile of some highway crossing. Now, now I can get GPS coordinates for everything if I was collecting. Used to be I'd actually drive my car and get mileage from some known landmark, like a highway crossing or whatever. So you see that on the label, the date, what it was doing when I caught it, to the point of what kind of plant it was nectaring on, if I caught it on a flower, and the, and the species identification is the other label. Well, that's incredibly valuable for conservation. The first thing scientists do when a species gets rare is they look in collections and try to find out where these things used to occur. Then you can go to those localities and if the habitat is still there, you might find the species there and you can protect those areas. So that's why scientific collections are actually a tool for wildlife conservation. And they obviously are very good educational materials. I mean, there's nothing like the real thing to be able to actually examine them. You can see the underside and the upper side. Um, taking photographs is great. The problem is some of them are not diagnostic to species. As I told you, there are some species you can only discriminate by looking at them mi microscopically. So you may be losing species if you didn't have collections where you knew for sure which genetic species it was. You can't get genetic material from a picture either. So, anyway. Use the, the life cycle is larvae and then they, they become, they go and they pupa, larva, pupa. pupa, pupa and, adult. and then they become the adult. And you also use the term chrysalis. Is chrysalis sort of a synonym for a pupa? And In a butterflies, a, the pupa is called either a chrysalid or a chrysalis or chrysalis, depending on how you enunciate it. But yes, yeah, a fancy name for a pupa. Okay. Only for butterflies. For moths, the pupa doesn't get a fancy name. It's just called a pupa. And that's because moth pupae are not fascinating. <laughs> they're bland. They all look very, pretty much similar. They're brown. They don't have sculpturing all of them because, again, they're hidden. Moth larvae either burrow into the sediments, leaf litter and or lead or ground, and use silt to make a cavern. And the pupa's inside that cavern, or either they make a cocoon. So the pupa doesn't need to be camouflaged. It's protected, it's hidden. But butterfly larvae make the chrysalid and it's usually where it's visible. So it has to have these sculpturing and stuff. So that's why it gets a fancy name. At least that's my theory. <laughs> to differentiate it from a moth pupa. But it is indeed in the metamorphic process, it's the pupa, it's the pupal stage. And again, that's where all growth is, is as a caterpillar. And just like, I mean, again, the, the ones that emerge in the spring. 
typically are smaller because they probably didn't have enough food resources when they were caterpillars in the fall. So they were underfed. They want a diet, basically, so they're smaller individuals when they emerge in the spring. And then their larvae are on very healthy, rapidly growing plant material in the spring. So the summer brood, the individuals are usually larger than are the ones that emerge from pupae. Typically, they pass the winter as a pupa, which in the case of a butterfly is a chrysalis or a chrysalis. But the size of that butterfly is already determined by the size of the... Size by what happened with the caterpillar. 